All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Bob. Um, yeah. So my name is Brian Heaton and I'm a, a planner by trade. And I recently, about a little over a year ago, uh, came to work for HCD in the recently created housing accountability unit. Um, so working kind of on the, the enforcement side of things. And uh, today I'm really excited to be presenting about uh, the most recent California housing laws and specifically what practicing planners should be mindful of as they go about their work. Um, as a planner, I'm, I'm excited to have that conversation. We, we give a lot of presentations to a, a, a wide variety of crowds, uh, but this one's a little more technical in nature and I'm, uh, I'm excited about that. There is a lot going on. Um, our legislature really cranks through the housing laws. And um, yeah, I think I would, I would assume you're gonna learn some today. So anything else, Bob, or should I, should I dive into this thing? Jump right in. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's get the screen share going. Okay. Um, can you see that? All right. Is that uh, screen yes. share popped up? Okay. Um, so the title of this presentation is um, HCD's Housing Accountability Unit Enforcing State Housing Laws to Achieve Local Housing Production. So the purpose of the HAU is to ensure uh, that local jurisdictions meet their fair share of the state's housing needs and to promote housing production at all income levels. And we do that by supporting jurisdictions in promoting housing production through incentives and planning grants through providing education and technical assistance to help jurisdictions understand and implement the law. And finally, to hold jurisdictions accountable for following the law through enforcement actions as needed. So this is our, um, our review process. It um, basically starts out at the very top with review. Um, HCD re receives a request. Requests come from developers, they come from advocates, they come from uh, planners at cities, a wide, wide variety of folks, but somebody says, hey, I've got a, a question or an issue. Um, can you look into it? And our first stop is always technical assistance. Uh, we typically set up a meeting with the, the local agency or and the complainant to kind of get both sides of the story, where's the disagreement, um, and really dial in on, on what the issue is. And from there, you can see it kind of splits into two tracks. We have our housing element enforcement line um, which can ultimately end up in, uh, in decertification if worse comes to worse. The other, um, the other line is the, our AB 72 authority, stuff like ADUs, density bonus law, housing crisis act, things like that. Um, and we start with technical assistance. Sometimes that can be verbal. We can just talk through an issue with somebody over the phone. Sometimes it's an email. Um, Mostly it ends up, I think, becoming formal letters of technical assistance, which is, is which can be helpful for planners, especially if they want to bring something forward to, to city council. It, it's on, you know, it's on letterhead. Um, and then if uh, worse comes to worse, we get to notice a violation. Um, and then that's ultimately kicked up to the attorney general, um, their staff, which also have their own. It's called the task, the housing task force. So they have their own team of attorneys that we communicate with uh, back and forth. So our authority comes um, in housing element law. Of course, that's you know uh, maybe the first thing people think when they think HCD. Um, AB 72 came out a few years ago. That gave HCD um, enforcement authority over the Housing Accountability Act, density bonus law, no net loss, and land use and discrimination law. As of January 1st, AB um, 215 came online, uh, which gave HCD authority over the Housing Crisis Act permit portions of the Permit Streamlining Act, uh, Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing or AFFH, everyone's favorite SB 35, which no one calls the Streamlined Ministerial Permit Process, even though that is the name, Byright Supportive Housing and Byright Low Barrier Navigation Centers. And we also do a lot of work with ADUs. We have an ADU team. Um, we have the Surplus Land Act is now under our purview as well and affordable housing preservation noticing law and rental inclusionary zoning um, with, uh, in addition to that, there's the limitation on development standards, which is very short and precise. Um, there was SB 478, which might be worth looking into. 
So the obligatory consequences of housing element non-compliance, everyone asked this question. Um, we won't spend a ton of time on it, but there's really three, um, three legs to the problem stool. Um, the first is the inability or delay in receiving state funds. The second is that um, under the Housing Accountability Act, it's not possible to use uh, the inconsistency with zoning or general plan standards to deny an affordable housing project. Um, and then there's, of course, the legal ramifications um, as well as there. So hopefully your, uh, your, your, uh, your agency is working towards a compliant housing element and keeping it that way. This is a very small snippet of our org chart. HCD has around 1,000 people. The Housing Policy Division has around 100. And um, the Land Use and Local Government Relations is around 30 to 40 people. Um, as you can see there, it's our little blue, blue corner. So let's get down to the good stuff. What should planners know about this stuff? You're busy. I get that. Uh, the first resource, and don't roll your eyes, is actually HCD's website. Um, it's been entirely redesigned. We've been putting a lot of really helpful content on there. Um, so this is the home page. You'll see circled in red is planning and community development. That's where the good stuff is if you're a planner. Once you click on that or there's a pull down tab, you'll arrive at the accountability and enforcement page. And we have on this page summaries of all of these laws, you know, four to five sentence long all the code references, it's all itemized there. Um, so you can get an orientation on what the laws are. We have these drop down menus and I call particular attention to these with the little yellow lightning bolts. Um, the first one is the technical assistance and enforcement letters. These are all public, they're all posted. So if you're working on, for example, a density bonus application and you'd like to know what topics HCD has been writing technical assistance on to other jurisdictions, it's really easy. You can sort by density bonus law and, you know, um, read through the last four or five density bonus letters to see if any of those letters are helpful to you in your situation. Um, and then at the bottom, enforcement authority itemizes the laws. And this is actually copy pasted right off our website. So if it seems like there's an endless number of laws, uh, there's not. This is this was what we came up with when we set about tallying up um, the laws to be mindful of. And there are uh, government code references on the website. I just didn't include those here. So we've of course got housing element law, housing accountability act, no net loss, density bonus, anti-discrimination land use, portions of the permit streamlining act, oddly not all of it, um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, the streamlined ministerial approval process, also known as SB 35, by right supportive um, housing and low barrier navigation centers, ADUs, and the affordable housing uh, preservation noticing law, as well as now real growth area is the surplus land act, which is now a housing law. Um, we're gonna get into that. And then the rental inclusionary housing, that's the limitations on inclusionary, um, inclusionary ordinances. And finally, the limitations on development standards. So we don't have time to get through all of this. So I have identified the, the big six I think of these as the ones that um, planners should really put a little more energy and attention into A, knowing what they are, being able to generally summarize what they do and when they apply. Um, so we're going to look at the Housing Accountability Act, No Net Loss Law, Density Bonus, a chunk of the Permit Streamlining Act, the Housing Crisis Act, and the Surplus Land Act. So kicking it off with the Housing Accountability Act. Some people, because this was amended by SB 330 and SB 8, a lot of people come in talking about the bill numbers. Uh, we really don't advise that, it's confusing. SB 330 amended the Housing Crisis Act, the Housing Accountability Act, and the Permit Streamlining Act. So uh, if possible, use the government code sections when you're talking to us or you know, use the acronym. It's a lot faster if you come in and say, I have a question about the Housing Accountability Act. Um, we can usually help you a little quicker. So the general rule of thumb, if you, if you commit nothing else to memory about the HAA, it's that if a project meets all objective development standards, it's likely to enjoy the protections of the HAA. Um, the, the inspiration for the HAA with folks sitting around saying, hey, isn't it unfortunate that a developer has proposed a project that meets all the zoning requirements, the building height, the setback, the density, the parking requirements, it's consistent with the general plan, consistent with the zoning, 
and it's still being denied or it's still being drastically modified. Um, wouldn't it be good if there were some limitations on that? So if the project involves a rezone and a general plan amendment, HAA probably is not going to be on, you know, something to be thinking about. But if you're seeing a project that's checking all the boxes, um, you know, that thought should come to mind. Hey, I wonder if this is affected by the HAA. So to meet the definition um, of a housing development project, generally the project just needs to have two or more housing units. Um, so even pretty vanilla uh, duplexes might potentially um, enjoy some sort of protection of this. Projects with 20% uh, or more affordable units receive additional protections, which in walk speak <laughs> involves the protections detailed in subdivision D and J. However, 100% uh, market rate developments also receive protections. Um, in this case, though, only the protections of subdivision J. So again, and this is what stood out to me as a planner, <laughs> even a market rate duplex um, might need a second look if it looks like it's you know, um, being steered towards denial. Qualifying projects can only be denied if very strict um, Find, or findings of denial can be made. That's how the HAA works. It basically says, if X, Y, and Z are met, you can't deny it. And also noteworthy, um, a project that uses the state density bonus law, um, particularly an incentive concession or development standard waiver to modify a development standard is still considered to meet all objective standards under the HAA. And there is a really great case um, called the California Renters Legal Advocacy and Education Fund v. the City of San Mateo, real recent 2021, that provides a great, um, a great introduction to how the law works. And that is an appellate, appellate decision. And this is a great quote, I think it's really helpful. The Court of Appeal held that a standard that cannot be applied without personal interpretation or subjective judgment is not objective under the HAA. So you're gonna hear that theme a lot in this presentation. Objective standards, good. <laughs> Subjective standards, bad. HCD has a, a technical advisory document on this topic, which I encourage you to get a copy of, or at least um, you know, store that PDF somewhere on your desktop uh, for reference. That document contains this very helpful flow chart, um, which works just the way flow charts work. Um, kind of work your way down from the top, is it, does it meet the def, does the project meet the definition of a housing development? Is it going to take the left side of the fork, which are um, projects that receive additional protections, or is it going to take the right side of the fork um, with somewhat lesser, but still some protections? I would take this to my, uh, my office wall if I were you. So, um, pivoting to another law, we're going to talk about no net loss. So no net loss imposes requirements on local jurisdictions to ensure that development opportunities remain available throughout the planning period and accommodate re to accommodate regional housing needs, allocations, especially for lower and moderate income households. Every time a project is proposed on a site identified in the housing element site inventory, the local agency needs to compare the proposed project's unit mix by affordability with the allocations shown in the housing element site inventory. Written findings are, required. So put them in. Uh, put them in your approval resolution. Talk about them in your staff report. And HCD also has a technical advisory memo for more uh, detail on how this works. Okay, switching over to my personal favorite, uh, the state density bonus law. So a few things have changed in recent years about the state density bonus law. Um, the first is that now, using the state density bonus law, up to 50% more units can be built um, than would otherwise be allowed. And if the project is 100% affordable, the increase is 80% uh, and even, one, even unlimited. But I don't think we have any major transit stops in Humboldt County. So uh, something to be mindful of. I, I know when I started here, I thought the max was 35% uh, and uh, was a little bit behind the times, realizing that it's now up to 50 Projects receive up to four concessions that can be used to waive or modify development standards. And the key concept um, for concessions is whether or not they would uh, reduce in a cost reduction. Doesn't matter how much of a cost reduction, 
just cost reduction is, is how the applicant justifies concessions. Paired up with concessions are um, everyone's favorite development standard waivers. Projects um, are eligible for an unlimited number of development standard waivers if conditions are met. And the condition that needs to be met is that the project would be physically precluded. So um, the building simply won't fit with the current um, setbacks. It simply can't fit within the number of um, stories that are ordinarily allowed in that zone. The minimum eligibility threshold is actually uh, 5%. And that is if the applicant decides to provide very low income units. Um, so keep that in mind. The projects are increasingly invoking both density bonus law and HAA protect, uh, protections. I've kind of alluded to that, especially applicants, uh, applications coming in a little bit bigger cities. Uh, a lot of times there's a cover letter that actually will, will spell out how the project qualifies for the density bonus law in addition to the Housing Accountability Act um, protections. And there are two really interesting cases um, that I believe both recently exhausted their, their uh, kind of legal remedies here. Um, known as the Schreiber v. City of Los Angeles 2021 case and the Bankers Hill uh, v. City of San Diego in, in 2022. So hot off the presses, I believe that they're uh, basically settled at this point. Um, they're not going to go any higher. They're both appellate decisions. Um, up until a couple of years ago, I didn't read court opinions. I just didn't, as a planner, I just never went there. Um, but I kind of regret it. Now I read them all the time. And these are great. They're 12 to 15 pages long. They really provide um, a very helpful narrative explaining how the project was structured, where the disagreement came about, how the court viewed the disagreement. Um, and I, a lot of this stuff deals with um, disagreements between, between the city and the applicant about how um, concessions and waivers would be handled. It's, it's jarring for a lot of local agencies, of course, when they need to, to waive or modify um, development standards. So. Highly recommended if you can spare any time. All right, eight common density bonus issues. Um, I stole this slide from an internal training presentation uh, because <laughs> when folks go to apply the density bonus law, um, a lot of times we're, we're kind of called in to pop the hood and to take a look at how, how the math problem is structured and, and how folks are going about it. And we, we find a a lot of issues kind of cropping up regularly. So unfortunately, we're not going to be able to get into all of them, but I just wanted to sprinkle a few in here just, um, just so you know kind of how we work. Uh, so the first off, we see a lot of bonus density eligibility confusion, just straight up um, planners or applicants not understanding how, um, how it works from the get-go. The second is base density. That's you need a base uh, you need a baseline from which you calculate your bonus. Um, sometimes the math is screwed up on that. Uh, density calculations without dwelling units per acre. As you know, in downtowns and mixed use zones, sometimes there isn't a dwelling units per acre density standard specified in the general plan or the zoning code. So um, consternation on that. It doesn't get you out of the density bonus law, not even for a minute. It just requires uh, a workaround. Incentives, concessions, and development standard waivers, um, eligibility confusion, um, big topic, and very similar, the adequate justification to grant incest, incest, incentives, concessions, and development standard waivers. Uh, probably the most common issue, applicants asking for something uh, in the city is um, requiring everything from soups and nuts. And there's been laws passed, um, again, we can't really get into it right now, but there are limitations on cities that want to require special studies, um, you know, pro formas, uh, things like that to really, really dial in. Um, for the most part, it's, it, you should just walk away from this knowing that it, it's limited the extent to which cities can require justification. Replacement provisions, both the Housing Crisis Act and the Density Bonus Law have replacement provisions. So if you're demolishing housing, especially affordable housing, it needs to go back. Um, as a part of the project. Infill development confu confusion. Um, it's easier to calculate a density bonus on a greenfield site. It gets confusing when there's already, you know, 20, a 20 unit apartment building and they're going to demolish half of the units and build more. How do you calculate your base density? Is it the new units? Do you calculate all of the units? Um, some frustration in that. 
conflicts between the density bonus law and other density bonus law implementing ordinances uh, or a local density bonus programs. This one we haven't got into a ton, um, but it seems like, like ripe fruit for the picking. Um, a lot of cities are increasingly interested in uh, community benefit zoning schemes and they make their own non-density bonus law affiliated density bonus program. And that can really throw a wrench into the operations of the state density bonus law because um, questions emerge. Does the applicant get to pick between the local density program and the state density program? Does the applicant have to exhaust the local program before they can use the state program? Vice versa. Um, it really causes a lot of complexity, but we're um, it's a it's a thing we're looking at right now. Okay, um, moving over to the Permit Streamlining Act. Um, this has been around for a long time. I encourage you to get refreshed on it. Uh, this requires uh, basically local decisions to or local jurisdictions to process and make decisions on housing projects within clearly defined time limits and provides remedies such as the project being deemed approved if timelines are not met. And to accelerate housing production, the PSA also provides a developer with the option of submitting a preliminary application for any housing development project, allowing the developer to freeze the applicable fees and development standards that apply to the project while the developer assembles the full application. Um, so we have information on this um, in HCD's preliminary application web page and also in our um, Housing Accountability Act Technical Assistance Advisory. So you probably already know about the, the PSA, but it uh, might be good to, to, to freshen up on it. We, we're starting to get complaints, and uh, I don't think we've actually written any standalone letters yet, um, but that is within our enforcement authority. So as staff, definitely don't just ignore um, the Permit Streamlining Act. Moving on to the, hold on, I'm going to move this. We have chat boxes. Um, moving on to the Housing Crisis Act, I think this is probably the most um, meaningful topic I think we're going to talk about today because it's the it's the most surprising. I think not as much fun as the density bonus law, but but definitely significant. So the Housing Crisis Act. Um, originally called or called the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. It came into effect uh, January 1st, 2020, and has since been amended slightly. So it's pretty new. It's pretty, pretty hot off the presses. Basically, what it does is it limits the ability of cities and counties. Now its effective date um, goes until 2030, up from 2025. So this is something that planners are going to be dealing with um, for at least the next eight years. And what it does is it limits the ability of cities and counties to reduce the intensity of land use within existing land use designations, impose moratoria or other similar restrictions on housing development, cap the number of housing units that can be approved or built, and it imposes requirements on developments that demolish housing units, including uh, in requiring the replacement of protected units, also called affordable units. Um, Basically, it has a five-year look back. So even if there are no affordable or low-income households in the units currently, um, if there were within the last five years, they, they also count. And it includes relocation benefits and a right of first, re, uh, first refusal, refusal to occupants of protected units that are of lower-income households. So your spider sense should definitely be tingling if, uh, if your agency is looking <laughs> is considering the demolition of um, housing units that are or were recently occupied by low-income households. So there's only two spots in this presentation where I actually take um, an excerpt out of state law, um, but we see this a lot. We actually have a shorthand for it. We call it a B1A in our, uh, in our team meetings. This is the section that deals with um, the reduction in intensity of uses. So it's written in a very um, kind of interesting way. It basically says, if the local agency is um, changing a general plan land use designation, specific plan land use designation or zoning on a parcel to a less intensive use or reducing the intensity of a use uh, within one of those areas, um, the developer, or the, uh, how am I gonna, how am I gonna phrase that? Um, it establishes a baseline of whatever the intensity of the, of the use was in 2018, 
and it uh, kind of requires that to be the measuring stick. Let me switch to the next one, highlight the, uh, the more helpful stuff. So what I have highlighted in yellow is what we're getting a lot of interest in. Um, basically, the definition of uh, reducing the intensity of land use. So reducing the intensity of land use includes, but is not limited to, reductions in height, density, floor area ratio, new or increased open space or lot size requirements, new or increased setback requirements, minimum frontage requirements, maximum lot coverage limitations, or any other action that would individually or cumulatively reduce the site's residential development capacity. So there's a little bit of confusion in this. The first thing I want to clear up is that the HCA does not prevent a local agency from downzoning. It doesn't prevent them from adopting new development standards. What it means is that it, they cannot do it in such a way that they're reducing the residential intensity unless they upzone to compensate. They need to perform some sort of compensatory action to make sure that they're not losing, uh, losing capacity. So that's what's explained in this middle section, um, you know, clause two little eyes. Um, but I encourage you to look it up in the actual statute. Um, and originally, and so that's like the first misconception is, is folks think that this says, oh, you just can't, you just can't reduce the intensity. You can, you just have to compensate for it. Um, as spelled out in the law. The second thing is folks think it means if you're reducing the the density, the dwelling units per acre. For example, a city has you know 200 acres that's zoned R3, and they decide that it should be zoned R2. Like that's a pretty clear case. That would be density. But it goes beyond that. It it also includes changes to minimum lot sizes, changes to setbacks, building heights. Um, so if in your R1 zone, your current a minimum lot size is 5,000 square feet, and city council decides, you know what, 5,000 square feet too small. We really think our minimum lot size in the R1 zone should be 7,000 square feet. We want extra room. That's the kind of town we are. Um, you, the, you need to perform this type of analysis. You need to, to think about and calculate very quantifiably, you know, um, how is that going to affect residential development capacity? It's not enough to just look at that, um, the dwelling units per acre figure. Same thing goes with if you're you know, in a zone where they want to reduce maximum building heights, you know, folks decide that three stories is too tall and really downtown should be limited to two story buildings. Okay, well, what effect would that have um, on the overall residential development capacity? So what we've, I guess, kind of been, um, you know, telling cities and planners, especially is just be prepared to show your work, you know, don't get caught flat footed in one of these, um, you know, in a situation where you just shrug your shoulders and say, oh, uh, we didn't we didn't calculate any of that. We just, you know, <laughs> we just tweaked our standards. It seemed like it'd be great. Beyond that, um, there's another really interesting section in here. Um, very close, instead of a B1A, it's a B1C. And that is uh, a limitation on imposing or enfo enforcing design standards established on or after January 1st, 2022, that are not objective design standards. So uh, planners should be mindful going forward. You know, um, cities, city zoning codes tend to grow over time because the regulatory ambitions, um, you know, of the jurisdiction tend to increase. Just make sure that um, you know you're not loading the zoning code up with lots and lots of new subjective standards, because um, that can cause you issues down the road. And finally, I think ooh, we're halfway point. Good. Uh, so finally, uh, the Surplus Lands Act. This uh, has been substantially retooled, so it kicks in anytime a local agency has a piece of land that they're going to sell or otherwise get rid of. Um, basically requires that uh, there are noticing requirements, good faith negotiate, negotiations, um, a priority for greater affordability on, you know, the ultimate uh, recipient and a minimum uh, affordability level. So it used to be um, it, uh, the developer of housing and in particular affordable housing didn't really have a spot in line as it was working as the process of getting rid of land Kind of was carried out. Um, but now anytime a, a local agency has has property, they should be thinking about it um, from this perspective, you know, first of all, recognizing that 
they're going to need to look at it from a surplus land act perspective and then secondly really tracing it through the um, the process so again you don't get caught flat-footed um, you know not realizing that there were surplus land act requirements and i believe these actually have to be sent into our surplus land act team um, to some extent i don't work on that team but um, if your city or county is getting rid of a piece of land definitely uh, spend a little time digging into the Surplus Land Act and reach out to HCD um, if you have any, any questions. Okay, so um, I boiled this down into six questions. If, if you take nothing else away, um, we can't answer you know, every single detail here, but just these are what I think of as the key questions the planner should be asking themselves um, you know, to avoid surprises. So the first category, I call it questions to answer when considering a development application. So somebody's dropped off an application, they've called you on the phone, they say, I want to build something. Um, first question, does the project create or demolish market rate or affordable units? Um, and that doesn't just mean they're actually deed restricted affordable units. That includes units that happen to just be occupied or previously occupied by lower income households. Uh, in that case, you should be thinking about the Housing Accountability Act, the Housing Crisis Act, and the Density Bonus Law. Um, it can be a little bit of a shocker, especially when um, cities are used to having inclusionary zoning. Uh, an applicant that, include, that provides affordable units to comply with the inclusionary zoning requirement has earned themselves, uh, themselves protection and benefits under the Density Bonus Law. Even if Density Bonus Law is not written anywhere on the application, they do apply. Um, the second question, is the project proposed on a site identified in the housing element site inventory? Think no net loss. Um, if you have a computer system, I think it'd be great to flag every single site and you have a big red, big red check mark or something pop up um, in your computer system whenever you enter in a parcel and finds out, lo and behold, that was in our, our uh, housing element site inventory. Uh, because you will need to make those written findings um, about, you know, when you're approving the, the project on that site. And finally, does or can the project meet all objective standards? You should think about the Housing Accountability Act. So even on vanilla stuff, even a garden variety triplex, um, you should kind of keep that in the back of your mind that um, it might enjoy those protections and you don't want to be surprised halfway through the process. So something to, you know, um, detail this stuff in your staff report, put it in your presentations to planning commission, you know, put it in your approval resolutions, show your work. It's always better when, you know, when we um, reach out to somebody and, and it turns out that they have thought about it, at least to some extent, than when they're completely blindsided. And the second category of questions are questions to answer when considering a proposed rezone or development standard modification. So the first off is, is this project a rezone or a downzone? Uh, if it is, think it through from a Housing Crisis Act and no net loss perspective. Um, second, does the project involve adopting new development standards for a topic that wasn't previously regulated? Is your town about to tackle hillside development regulations, design standards, or view protection regulations for the first time? Uh, if so, think about the Housing Crisis Act. Again, it doesn't stop a city from, from adopting new regulations. Um, if your town's really excited about uh, taking a crack at, uh, you know, design standards, regulating, you know, um, exactly what type of an, e how deep of eaves a new building can have, that's great, go for it. Um, but make sure you're not reducing residential development capacity um, and that you're not accounting for. And finally, does the project involve modifying existing development standards? Um, such as building heights or open space requirements, be mindful of that. Um, you know, you can inadvertently reduce residential development capacity and, uh, and kind of get yourself in, in hot water if you're not thinking it through from this perspective um, right from the get go. And to that end, you probably heard me say the word objective a lot. Uh, HDD has a handy guide to help local agency write objective um, objective design standards. It gives you some great ideas um, of, you know, kind of practical concrete stuff. So I highly recommend that. That's on the website. And finally, um, here's our stock, our stock final presentation slide. Um, the, right in the center of that slide, you'll see the two, two email addresses. 
compliance review is the inbox for requests for technical assistance or um, requests for review. Um, but again, almost we, we do very few letter or notices of violation. Really, what we do is is uh, provide technical assistance. That's probably 95% of our output. And uh, we're happy to speak at uh, different events and whatnot. And we are also scaling up dramatically. Um, the legislature, as you probably saw through that slide, um, they keep expanding our enforcement authorities over more and more laws and with greater and greater expectations um, to provide another option to help uh, facilitate housing production, which before we existed, there was really only one option. And that was if, if the developer was in disagreement with the city, a, a lawsuit was really the only way to move it forward. Um, and, uh, and yeah, there's just more interest in having the state have a little bit more of an active role in helping to work out the kinks and uh, you know get projects moving forward. So that's the, the final slide. I'm gonna stop my, my share here. Well, thank you, Brian. That was very informative, somewhat scary in some instances, <laughs> but to be forearmed is, or to be forewarned is to be forearmed, so. Anyway, Show your work. <laughs> yes. <laughs> did have a couple of questions, and I encourage others to either use the question answer or the chat if you have other questions, but you're mentioning the state density bonus law. And I was thinking of the same thing is, is there any pitfalls for adopting that in a local ordinance? And I guess just as a follow up to that, just, you know, some people are adopting ADU ordinances and other, but the state seems to keep changing certain rules. So like the old days, I think we had to have a policy that referenced the state uh, density bonus law. And it, like you said, it was 35% at the time. Yeah, no, that is a that is a great um, a great question. The, conventionally, the assumption has been that every city and county needs a fully comprehensive density bonus law implementation ordinance that explains everything. Um, we haven't generated any formal TA on this topic, but the possibility exists, at least from our reading, that as long as the application components are addressed. Um, because if you read in the density bonus law, the places where it's most explicit about what the local agency needs to do, it's really in the application section. Um, so providing like, yes, we're going to have application materials, you know, this is how it works, but the actual content, uh, like for example, the density bonus table, right? What percentage of, of, you know, affordable units earns you what percentage bonus? Um, I think the possibility exists for that to just be referenced directly to the statute. And that way, if there is a tweak, you just go pop open the, you know, the bonus and say, oh, well, that was convenient. You know, they modified it, but we don't have to change our code at all because it's captured. We're definitely not at the point of saying don't do it, um, but I would, I would love to see us dig into that a little bit more. But again, it's, it's not a, we haven't made any sort of formal kind of determination on that. But I, that question comes up a fair amount because it's exhausting to amend your, your density bonus lord or it's basically every year right and i did want to say that for some reason the chat function was not usable it, it should be now if you tried that and again you can also ask in the question answer um, so another question was raised can we hear a little more about pitfalls of local community benefits in context of dbl hope you know what that means oh, <laughs> where zone does not have a maximum density or floor area ratio, just a height limit? Yeah, so that's, that's, two, that's two questions. That is something that we, we talk about um, a fair amount. It comes, comes through the door. So the first question, this community benefit zoning, um, it's all over. It's this idea that instead of just having requirements, the city has this like menu of options saying, hey, if you paint a mural, will let you have an extra unit. Or, you know, if you put in really deluxe bike ped improvements, we'll let you have, you know, something of a benefit to you. Um, we haven't really dug into it yet. It's a question that has come up. We definitely foresee some issues, especially with, if for no other reason, it's very confusing 
because in some cities, an applicant can earn a density bonus by including affordable units <laughs> via a program that's <laughs> not affiliated with the state density bonus law. So it's very, very similar. So um, I don't have like a concrete, concrete answer about what, what you absolutely should or shouldn't do, um, but just be mindful and always be thinking, you know, when the applicant comes in, they're going to have a familiarity with the density bonus law, make sure that there's not going to be a conflict or that one is obviously uh, being undermined by the other. The second part to that is um, zones that don't have dwelling units per acre. This is one of our top topics. Um, we, are work, we are looking into it for a particular jurisdiction. Um, again, it's, it's too early. I don't want to give the spoiler of kind of where we're landing on it, but um, it, it, it has been identified absolutely as a need. Um, the only thing I can say for sure is, no, it does not get you out of the density bonus law. Uh, in like in any way, it just requires a different method of calculating the bonus. So one of our speakers a while back, I'm um, talking about middle, the missing middle housing, talked about jurisdictions should be getting rid of things such as density and flow rate ratio and other restrictions and to allow the flexibility for housing. But it seems like as you get rid of those restrictions, you start to run into some issues with the state density bonus law and other things. Um, would you advise, I mean, like if, if there is no density requirement, then there really isn't a state density bonus. It would be just limited to height other than the request to increase that height, I would guess. It's at the very most fundamental level, the, the, the idea behind the density bonus law is it's a, it's a trade. The, it's, it's really set up to work for market rate developers, I think. I mean, it obviously helps 100% affordable developers, but it's at its heart, it's this idea where you might have a market rate developer, they're not, it's not on their radar to build affordable housing. Like they just, they're trying to build a market rate development and they're making a trade. They're, they're gonna, they're saying, okay, I will voluntarily build these affordable units and to compensate, I need more market rate units. So that is, that, functioning has been demonstrated since since the law was passed in, in 1979. Um, and it's really been successful. Um, it's produced a ton of housing and, and uniquely it produces housing in a lot of instances without any government subsidy, um, which is pretty remarkable, you know, to see those affordable units appear, um, you know, as as a part of the, the overall development process. So, I mean, it's an institution. It's a it's a total pillar. Um, so I foresee, I mean, it, it functions now. I foresee it functioning into the future. The legislature amends it all the time. Hundreds, maybe thousands of projects are proposed every year. So it's not so much a question of, you know, what should the city not do or not do to undermine it, just plan for it, you know, be, be aware that those applications are gonna come in and, you know, be prepared to process them. We have a question about, um... How do these laws interact with the Coastal Act? You probably anticipated that question. And how does HCD interact with the Coastal Commission? And you just mentioned density bonus law. How does that relate yeah, most, to the coastal zone? Yeah, most of the housing laws actually have a subdivision that talks about the Coastal Act. It's like pretty pretty common. Um, there there was a there was a case that made. Uh, basically settled the issue of um, the relationship between the density bonus law and the, and the coastal act and the density bonus law is subordinate to the coastal act. So it, it basically has to be baked into the LCP, um, you know, for it to, for it to work. This is my, my takeaway on it. Yeah. What about other issues like, um, you know, all the water law, water management requirements. So it seems like we have a, water crisis, especially in the drought we're experiencing, and then we have the housing crisis, and how do those two interact with each other? Uh, in tricky ways. Those are some of our, <laughs> those are some of our kind of sticky, you know, sticky issues, uh, because it's competing, you know, land use has competing priorities, um, you know, fire safety matters, uh, water availability, and you know, and environmental impacts matter, like without a doubt, housing production also matters. Um, so I don't, I don't have any, there, there's not like a, you know, 
a ranking of which one overcomes which. Uh, but but yeah, it's it's a topic, and we do have we do have issues like that, and and we do work with our partners and other other agencies and departments. We we meet regularly with the Coastal Commission staff. Um, you know, we talk to folks at the Water Board. Uh, it's 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 all, you know, it's a balance. You need a balanced approach, I guess, at the end of the day. Going back to something we were talking about earlier, but the question is, when do you anticipate HCD guidance on community benefit zoning and density bonus law? And you probably are aware of what the city of Arcata is doing with their gateway project. <laughs> um, we don't typically write that uh, a dedicated guidance document on, um, on, on density bonus law because it changes so fast. Uh, but it is a topic that we're aware of. Um, it's coming up. I think, you know, we probably will be doing maybe a, a technical assistance letter to a particular jurisdiction. Um, it's just really something we, that isn't fully, fully baked yet. We're just starting to, uh, to really dig into it. Okay. Um, my last question I have here, Gary, I don't know if you have any, or, but can complaints be filed anonymously? For example, an employee or whistleblower, and I'm thinking it has relationship. <laughs> yeah, um, currently I think the answer is no. And I think it's mostly because of the, uh, you know, freedom of information uh, requests. Um, basically anything you send to the government is, is, is public. Um, so somebody can find out. I've heard, I've heard rumors that like people have got sent in like, you know, they've, they've made like a burner Gmail account <laughs> and, you know, and sent stuff in like that. Um, one thing we see a lot is folks just reach out to advocates because then you're one step removed um, and advocacy organizations, they don't, you know, they typically don't mind. I mean, that's what they do is, is comment on things and be the public face of, of concerns and it, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. I do have another question. What if a city is updating existing subjective design review guidelines to make them more objective, but they're not strictly objective. That's a tricky case by case um, answer. Um, I mean, I, I think it's fair. I feel I would feel comfortable enough saying that the, the more subjective the standards are, the riskier it is going forward. It's, you know, I mean, I, it's kind of my personal view. It seems it, it's becoming more apparent that it's kind of a liability to have development standards that are subjective because when these projects are proposed and they make use of the protections and benefits of these housing laws, they can sometimes, you know, not be as effective, not hold up the way uh, an objective standard holds up. I mean, if you spell it out, if you quantify it, if you say the roof pitch shall be X and the setback shall be Y, that's black and white. You know, when you start getting into these areas, you know, you know, the roof pitch shall be appropriate. <laughs> like, what does that mean? You know, if, if it goes to court, maybe that won't stand up. But man, this is not legal advice. <laughs> this is just generally speaking, the, the takeaway is that, um, you know, really sit down and ponder hard. Is there any way <laughs> to make that standard objective? Um, is kind of the, the main takeaway. Um, question with the, in, the intensity. So if you have, if you're reducing residential intensity, I mean, you mentioned one example is you would increase the intensity on a different parcel, but could you also do it on the same? So if you're increasing the uh, minimum um, parcel size for, for single family residential, you use the example from 5,000 to 7,000, could you then increase the height restriction so it would be higher, or reduce the setbacks, or reduce the parking. Could you? That is a, that's a great question. So the Housing Crisis Act is pretty new. Uh, it's pretty recent. We don't have a lot of um, of rock solid examples, and and we probably won't ever. Um, a lot of this stuff is intentionally vague. I think what it would look like, though, um, would be there would be probably a some math problems. <laughs> 
you know, stuck into the staff report. There would be an addendum with a table in it that says, yeah, we've got a thousand acres of R1 land. And, you know, by changing this minimum lot size, we're going to see a total reduction in, you know, 300 lots each lot, you know, and then just kind of, it's just about showing your work. I don't think the law is ever going to, you know, really specify exactly that, but a good, a good way to measure it is just floor area. That's the, you know, that's kind of a, an easily, um, yeah. you know, verifiable concept like, oh, we're going to make the building heights lower. Okay. Well, you know, what's our lot coverage? What are our setbacks? Can you achieve a comparable floor area with a one-story building compared to a two-story building? It's like, so you might have to say something, you know, in a city, you know, in a meeting where, hey, you know, city council, if you want us to go from two stories to one story, we're going to need to reduce the rear yard setback from 20 feet to 10 feet. And that's fine, you know, as long as you show your math, because there's nothing, you know, necessarily wrong with that. Maybe people would rather the preference in the community is to have shorter buildings, but smaller setbacks, or it could be the opposite, you know. Okay, good. Uh, we did another question. Um, <clears throat> what are the state housing laws related to encouraging housing to be built in locations with better access to jobs and services, re i.e. reducing VMT? A lot of them. That's, um, that's cropping up a lot. Uh, just off the top of my head, density bonus law. Um, you can achieve up to unlimited density for 100% affordable projects if they're near a transit stop. Um, I think I've, I've heard of VMT creeping into some stuff. Um, but yeah, that's generally, that's generally on the scene, the direction of saying, you know, the areas that are, you know, walkable and less car dependent should see more development, um, you know, for kind of greenhouse purposes. So what about a, just hypothetically thinking about a jurisdiction that doesn't like the sprawl or things getting closer to their city limits or county. And so they want to refocus so that there's higher density. I guess it gets back into the reducing the intensity. So you can reduce the intensity in the sprawling areas of your jurisdiction and, and intensify it. Likewise, in the more job oriented, DMT oriented areas. Yeah, I mean, I, this is a great opportunity to, you know, impress upon everyone the idea that the interrelations between all of these laws also have to be balanced. So maybe from a Housing Crisis Act perspective, you say, yeah, we're going to, our single family residential zones are going to get less dense. And we're going to compensate by allowing way more density in our downtown. We're going to let all the buildings be three stories taller because uh, we think that'd be cool. But then, you know, maybe there's questions about, uh, you know, fair housing and discrimination and, uh, and access. You know, maybe your constant, maybe there's, you know, you know, re, what, amenity rich, re, high resource areas are farther out, you know, and you're not going to grow there. So there, maybe there's another, you know, there are other angles. So it's really, there's a constellation of housing laws um, that, you know, the devil's in, in the relationships between them. But I think strictly from an HCA perspective, I mean, at least that's kind of where we're landing is that it's really a, it's a quantitative problem, you, you know, you remove density, remove floor area from this side, add it on this side, balance them out. Yeah, okay. So I had a uh, applicability question. I was, I was wondering which of these housing laws don't apply to jurisdictions that don't meet the definition of an urbanized area or urban cluster. Uh, <laughs> Gary, I was wondering if you were gonna ask that because some of them apply everywhere. Some of them don't apply everywhere. Um, I didn't make a summary table of all jurisdictions in, in Humboldt County and, uh, <laughs> and break them down. So, I mean, maybe that's a project, you know, maybe, uh, you know, write down all six and then go through each one, one by one and cross them off if uh, it doesn't apply to, uh, you know, some tiny hamlet. Well, we've answered all the listed questions and all the ones I've had. Uh, Gary, anybody else? Last call? Looks like there is uh, one last question. I don't think you got to. Um, it says, if uh, local infrastructure is insufficient to serve both major new housing development by a state body, for example, a university, and housing 
development previously anticipated by the host local government plan. Does HCD's housing law have any bearing on that? Um, well, first of all, I would rephrase that. It's not HCD's housing law. We are, we are a branch of the, we are part of the executive branch of government. Um, the laws are passed in the legislature by, by our representatives. Um, but that's a great question. Um, you know, there, there is, there, we do get that question sometimes, you know, for cities where they have a, a true obvious water shortage. And in other times it's like, you know, maybe there's a, a fire risk or some other side. And, and I think sometimes those folks are, are kind of fishing for an answer where they'll just get a pass and it'll just be like, okay, we've decided the state of California has just decided like you're, you're fine. Like just, you just go, li go live your life. It doesn't usually work that way. It's, it's usually more of a, you know, the challenge of balancing, um, balancing competing priorities, you know, balancing the need to accommodate growth and the jobs housing balance and RENA with balancing environmental impacts you know, balancing all of these other things that matter. Um, you know, it's, it's a, there's, not a, there's not a fast or, or obvious answer. I would say, at least from a legal perspective on each law, you can always check the eligibility um, because some of the laws are limited and they don't apply everywhere. Some laws are more tailored towards, you know, the major metropolitan areas, some apply everywhere, um, but it's, uh, it, it's tricky. It's, uh, it is a tricky thing to, to manage land use in a way that achieves the optimal balance um, all the way around. We did get another question and one answer to one of them is, um, tomorrow all of our attendees and those who missed the thing will get a thank you for attending or sorry you missed and it'll have a link to the recording for this presentation. Um, and then there is one question Who's enforcing GC section 8899.5 of the broader requirement for the FFH lens? Uh, AFFH is, is HCD. So you can send in AFFH um, questions or, or uh, you know, inquiry to our, to our line. I think mostly AFFH is cropping up in the housing element um, process, but yeah, you can definitely, Send an email and we can get you over to the right um, AFFH person. Okay. All right, I think we're out of time and out of questions. Well, thank you, Brian, very much for your presentation. There was great. And uh, I think many of us might be in touch with follow up to you, keep you busy. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck out there. Okay. Take care, everybody. <laughs>